So we are starting here with chapter 18, electrochemistry. This is probably one of my, if not my favorite chapter of the year. Uh, so here's the deal, to talk electrochemistry and to get into kind of the what's going on with electricity and what's that do with chemistry, electrochemistry, we need to first talk oxidation reduction and oxidation numbers. So electrochemistry uses a specific type of reaction called a redox or a reduction or oxidation reduction reaction. And the heart of a, a redox reaction is these things called oxidation numbers. And we have some rules that we have to deal with when talking oxidation numbers. So here are the rules for the finding the oxidation number of an atom. And that's what it is. It's atom by atom. So if you have an ionic compound, each ion in that compound will have an oxidation number equal to whatever its charge is. Um, if oxygen is in a compound, except in a peroxide ion, and again, a peroxide ion is an O2, 2 negative. Um, and in that case, each oxide would be a negative one, but generally oxide um, in a compound, oxygen in a compound, ionic or molecular, will have an oxidation number of negative two. Uh, hydrogen will have an oxidation number of plus one or minus one, depending on it's, what it's bonded to. It's going to be a plus one when we see it bonded with nonmetals, and a minus one when we see it bonded with metals. Everything else, so those are kind of your standards. Everything else's oxidation number is whatever it has to be so that the sum of all the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in the compound add up to whatever charge is on that compound. So we're gonna look through a couple examples, make sure we can deal with these oxidation numbers correctly. So NaCl, looking at this, NaCl, that's an ionic compound because we have metals with nonmetals. So that means their oxidation numbers will just be whatever their charge is. So that chloride has a charge of negative one, sodium has a charge of plus one, so that is the oxidation numbers on those atoms. And again, that's it, on a compound, so the oxidation number is same as the charges. So CO2, this one's a little trickier because it's a molecular compound. So what we do is we recognize carbon varies. It's not one of our always things. So we're gonna look at the oxygen. Oxygen will always be a negative two because it's not a peroxide ion. There's two of them. So that means that there is a total of four negatives. So we look at the charge on the compound. Carbon dioxide is neutral. So that means all the oxidation numbers have to add up to zero. Since we have a four negative, that means that the carbon has to have a four plus as its oxidation number. All the carbons have a charge of four plus in this case. There's only one carbon, so that means that that carbon atom has an oxidation number of plus four. So again, I like to do this, start with the oxygen, and I write it up top, multiply it by its subscript. That tells me kind of how much we're dealing with there. Look at the charge and figure out what everything else has to be. A few more examples. SO4, two negative. So, each oxygen is still negative two. There's four of them, so there's a total of negative eight. The charge on the sulfate is negative two. So we ask ourselves what plus, so negative eight plus what is negative two? And the answer to that would be plus six. So those sulfurs have a charge of plus six. There's only one sulfur. So that sulfur has an oxidation number of plus six. So now that we're, I have an idea of how to find oxidation numbers, let's use them. And that's what section 18.2 is about. It's officially balancing them. You don't, you're not gonna have to balance oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions on the AP test. Um, but we need to use some of the skills that go into it. So how do we know if a reaction is a redox reaction? Well, if we see a change in the oxidation numbers, 
if any atom, if any atom has a change in its oxidation number from the reactants to the products, it's a redox reaction. And that, so we have to actually analyze every single atom in every compound in a reaction to see if it's a redox reaction. And again, if any of the oxidation numbers change, it will be a redox reaction, period. Now, some busyness. So say it's something is oxidized. An atom or element is oxidized when it loses electrons. Here's where we have to be careful. Think about what this means in terms of charge. And this is where the oxidation number kind of comes in. So electrons are negative. So if something loses electrons, if something loses electrons, that means it becomes either less negative or more positive. So if the oxidation number goes from like negative four to negative two, that would be losing electrons. If it goes from like plus two to plus four, that would be losing electrons. That means that atom was oxidized. To be reduced is the opposite. An atom or an element is reduced when it gains electrons. That means it's going to become um, less positive or more negative. The way I view this and the way I always remember, and I, often, I break everything down in electrochemistry to what I call simple truths. And when I'm working out problems, I remind myself of what those simple truths are. The first simple truth for this chapter is that reduction is gain of electrons. And I remember because it's backwards, we think of reduction as losing. No, no, no. Reduction is the gaining of electrons. It's backwards. And so that's how I look at it. So something is reduced if it gains electrons. And it's all about electrons. So changing oxidation states. So here's an example of a reaction. It's a classic one. We're going to see this over and over and over again, this particular uh, unit. So looking at this, we can clearly see changes in charge. We see our zinc going from a neutral to a plus two. We see the hydrogen ions going from a plus to a neutral. So we are clearly changing charge. We would say that the zinc is oxidized and the hydrogen is reduced. And that the electrons are actually being transferred from the zinc to the hydrogen. Again, how do we know this? Again, reduction is the gain of electrons. Oh, that's a terrible spelling. Oh, that's a, actually, I spelled it right. The E there for electrons. Okay. Whew. So reduction is the gain of electrons. So we see the hydrogen going from a positive to a neutral. To go from positive to a neutral, it had to gain electrons. It's becoming more negative. Now, since it gained electrons, those electrons have to come from somewhere. They come from the other part of the reaction. So the zinc went from neutral to plus two. To go from neutral plus two, it had to lose electrons. To lose electrons means it was oxidized. And it's the electrons are actually going from the zinc to the hydrogen. And as a note, redox reactions tend to be very spectacularly, spectacularly energetic because this transfer of electrons actually produces heat and it can produce light. And this is actually where electricity comes from. This electrical energy is from this movement of the electrons. Now, this reaction would be thermodynamically favored and proceed spontaneously. We'll learn more about how to analyze that later. So changing oxidation. So again, we can write the previous reaction in terms of oxidation numbers. So I write the reaction out. I write the oxidation number. So that zinc, it's by itself. Things in their elemental form will always be zero. So that's why the zinc here is zero. That's why this hydrogen here is zero. 
And again, things that are ions, whatever their charge is, is their oxidation number. So the hydrogen is a plus one, zinc is a plus two. We can clearly see oxidation numbers changing. And so by writing the oxidation state for each element, we can see the oxidation state changes happen. So we know it is redox. Now, in some reactions, there's no clear transfer of electrons, but the oxidation numbers do. So consider this. We don't see any positives or negatives in here. So looking at this, it's not as clear <coughs> excuse me, that there are changes in the oxidation numbers. But when I analyze them, we see some. So the hydrogen and oxygen would be zero because they're in the, their elemental form. Oxygen in a compound is always negative two. That means each of those hydrogens has to be a plus one to balance it out. So the hydrogen goes from a zero to a plus one. The oxygen goes from a zero to a negative two. So I'd start with that um, zero to negative two. So to go from zero to negative two, did the oxygen gain or lose electrons? Remember, electrons have a negative charge. Well, to go from zero to negative two, it had to gain electrons. And the gain of electrons we call reduction. And that means that the hydrogen going from a zero to a plus one to become more positive had to lose electrons. And the loss of electrons is oxidation. So again, hydrogen is oxidized, oxygen is reduced. That's how we have to do it, one by one. And again, this is oxidation re uh, reduction reaction or redox because oxidation numbers change. <coughs> so in the previous examples that we saw there, uh, water is not ionic. So there is no tr complete transfer of electrons from the hydrogen to the oxygen. It's not, that's what ionic is. But oxidation numbers are kind of a bookkeeping method. They, they're not saying these are the actual charges. What it's saying is, if this were ionic, what would the charges be? That's kind of what oxidation numbers are about. But when we're dealing with molecular compounds, it's not saying this is the charge. It's saying if it were ionic, this is what the charge would be. Now, in any redox reaction, we have to have both oxidation and reduction because the electrons have to go from something to something. So again, if something is oxidized, something else has to be reduced. The electrons must go from one place to another. And when we balance an equation, we have to obey the law of conservation of mass. That's what balancing is. But now we have to take into consideration the number of electrons as well. So again, gains and losses of electrons must be balanced. And this means that if a substance loses a certain number of electrons, the other substance must gain that exact same number. Some redox reactions do this pretty much automatically. Others we have to manipulate. So when dealing with a redox reaction, it's often really helpful to look at something called a half reaction. So even though in a reaction, a redox reaction, the oxidation reduction processes take place at the same time, it's often easier to consider them separately. And this is going to save us some trouble later down the road. So for instance, here is a redox reaction. So we can see just for instance, we see the tin here going from a two plus to a four plus. So because it went from a two plus to a four plus, that means it had to lose electrons and losing electrons again, as we know is oxidation. The iron goes from a three plus to a two plus. So it becomes more negative, which means it's gaining electrons. So that means it was reduced. So we can actually think of this as two separate processes. First, we have the oxidation of the tin and the reduction of the iron. And so we can write these as two separate things. So for the oxidation, we see the tin, we see it going to tin four, uh, tin four and the two electrons. Now the electrons in a half reaction are often shown. And if we notice, that means that the charge ends up being balanced as well. So again, two positive charges on the right and a net two positive left and a net two positive charges on the right because of the four plus and the two negatives. We also have the reduction. So again, we, and we can see with the oxidation, the electrons are in the products reduction electrons are at the beginning because uh, reduction is the gaining of electrons. That's one of our simple truths. 
Um, and again, that's what I say there, but again, breaking a redox reaction up into the two half reactions is going to help a lot. So again, we call those half reactions. So an equation that alone shows either the oxidation or reduction, we call the half reaction. Now, in the overall reaction, the number of electrons lost in the oxidation re half reaction must equal the number of electrons gained in the reduction half reaction because in the overall reaction, again, electrons have to be conserved. Now, when this condition is met and each half reaction is balanced and the two electrons on the sides cancel, uh, we get our overall balanced equation. So now in section 18.3, we are going to get into the fun stuff, voltaic cells. Now, energy that's released during a spontaneous redox reaction, that energy can be used to perform electrical work, aka electricity. This is done through the process of what's called a voltaic or galvanic cell. Um, in short, a battery. I know it's not quite the same, but for our purposes, it's a battery. And all this is, it's a device in which the transfer of electrons takes place through an external pathway. So again, a voltaic cell is going to be powered by a redox reaction, but that electron transfer is going to, we're going to do some shenanigans to make those electrons move through some external pathway. So we can channel where the electrons are moving. And this is again, rather than directly between the two reactors. So an example of this is when a strip of zinc is placed in contact with a, a solution containing copper ions. So I'm going to show some pictures, show some stuff going on here. So as the reaction proceeds, we're going to see the blue color of the copper ions fade because copper 2 plus is blue. And then the copper is actually going to deposit onto the zinc. At the same time, the zinc is dissolving into the solution. Again, I'm going to show a picture of this coming up. And this would be the reaction. So again, if we look at this, so we start with the solid zinc. We start with aqueous copper. As the reaction runs, the solid zinc becomes aqueous zinc, so it's being uh, dissolved into the solution. And then the copper is coming out of the solution and being plated as a solid. So that's what's happening. So we can see up top, we have the copper two sulfate, the sulfate we don't really care about. It's the copper two in there. We have the zinc strip. Um, we see that nice blue color in the solution because of the copper and then what's happening here through this redox reaction we see electrons going from the zinc to the copper and as the copper gains electrons it goes from copper 2 plus to copper it becomes a solid plating onto the solid zinc but when the zinc loses the electrons it goes into the solution in aqueous so that's what we see happening on a molecular level but this is the same situation, but with a twist. This time the zinc and copper are not in direct contact. Notice that I have two separate containers there. The zinc, which is what we see right there, is placed in contact with a zinc solution. So that would be like zinc and like zinc nitrate or something like that um, in the container on the right. The copper, solid copper metal, is placed in contact with copper in another container. So we'd have like copper metal and like a copper nitrate solution. Now notice, I'm gonna put it in, let's do purple. This wire here kind of goes around, stuff happens, but this wire connects the two together. This is that making the electrons flow through the external wire. So the way this is working, so this reduction of the copper can only occur when the electrons go to the copper. Now those electrons are coming through the flow of electrons coming from that external wire. The wire is connecting the zinc and copper strips. Now by physically separating the reduction half of the reaction from the oxidation half, so we're actually physically separating the two half reactions. What we're doing is we're creating a flow of electrons through some external wire, through some external circuit. And that is what electricity is. Now, the two solid metals that are connecting those, um, by the, uh, the, connecting the external circuit, in this case, the copper metal and the zinc metal, we call electrodes. The electrode at which oxidation occurs is called the anode. 
and the electrode at which reduction occurs is called the cathode. You will need to remember those. Those are another one of our simple truths. Just like the reduction is gaining of electrons, this is our next simple truth. Oxidation takes place at the anode, reduction takes place at the cathode. There's a couple ways to remember this. The way that most chemistry teachers teach this is that oxidation and anode both start with a vowel. Reduction and cathode both start with a consonant. That's one way to remember it. But because you are my students, I'm going to share with you my very personal, heartwarming, very touching, and now tragic story. Way to remember this. This was my cat, Matthew. Matthew died um, July of 2020 this year. But this was Matthew. Gaze upon his fuzzy, fat glory. He was just as sweet as these pictures indicate, by the way. So, this is my cat, Matthew. He is fat, or was fat, and had to go on a diet. So you can remember, cats must be reduced. Reduction takes place at the cathode. So again, cats must be reduced. Now, as in the example we saw with the zinc and the copper, the electrodes can, are often made of the materials that participate. So if we have um, a copper solution, we use a copper electrode. If we have um, like the zinc solution, we're gonna use zinc. But in a lot of commercial products like car batteries, things like that, the electrodes are made of some conducting material that it itself is not going to gain or lose mass during the reaction. It's just there to act as a conductor. Um, and again, it's just acting as a surface in which electrons are transferred. Um, very, very common would be like graphite. So in your car battery, they use graphite. In high-end batteries or things like that, they'll probably use platinum. Now, each compo or component or compartment in that overall voltaic cell is called a half cell. The whole thing together is a voltaic cell. Each half is a half cell. One half cell is where the oxidation half reaction takes place. And again, this is where we would see the anode. And then one half cell is where the reduction half reaction takes place. This would be the cathode. So we see that overall reaction again. So we're continuing with our present example. So we know that the zinc is oxidized, the copper is reduced again, the copper is reduced because to go from copper two plus to copper solid has to gain electrons. Gaining of electrons is reduction. So the half reaction at the anode would be this. Half reaction at the cathode would be this. Okay. Now again, electrons become available. So these electrons in the cathode are coming from these electrons being produced in the anode. So the electrons are flowing from the anode to the cathode through the external circuit. And there the electrons are kind of being consumed or used as the copper ions become reduced. Now what's happening, notice the zinc here is going from zinc solid to zinc ion. So that means the zinc electrode is actually losing mass as it proceeds because it's going from zinc solid to zinc um, aqueous. Likewise, the copper electrode is actually gaining mass because it's going from copper ions to copper solid. Oh no, I'm dropping things all over the place. That's what I say there. So for a voltaic cell to work, there's a few requirements that must be met. One, and really most importantly, the solutions in the two half cells must remain neutral. Their char overall charge can't change. Now, as zinc is oxidized, zinc ions enter the solution. So this means in the zinc half cell, in the oxidation half cell, in the anode compartment, we need some way for positive ions to leave or for negative ions to enter. Because if all that was happening was the zinc turning into zinc two plus, that half cell would become increasingly positive, but then the voltaic cell wouldn't work. Similarly, at the reduction, we're losing positive charge because we're losing those copper two plus ions. They're going in, uh, becoming solid, so it's actually becoming less positive as it runs. 
So again, we get this excess of negative charge or a, a decrease in positive charge. So if that was all that was happening, we would see this, um, the, the cath cathode side becoming um, increasingly, well, less positive. So we have to either migrate positive charge in or remove something negative to keep it neutral. So how do we do this? We do this through the use of what's called a salt bridge. And a salt bridge just allows ions, again, charged particles, positive and negative, to move from one solution to the other, keeping the solution neutral. So the side that needs more positive has positive cations enter from the salt bridge. The side that needs to become more negative has negative ions moving into it. Thus, the electron flow can remain. And all the salt bridge, is, salt bridge is, it's a tube that contains some salt in it that's not going to react with other ions in the cell or with the electrode. So it's just a non-reactive salt, non-reactive ionic compound. Um, really, on simple levels, all the, when I say tube here, that's even more fancy than we need. Like when I do labs where we make voltaic cells, it's really as simple as a piece of tissue paper soaked in a salt solution. It's, it's that complex. Now, commercial batteries, commercial voltaic cells, they get a bit fancier. Now, as for oxidation reduction proceed, ions from the salt bridge migrate in to neutralize the ch uh, charge. So again, as uh, one side is losing positive charge, positive charge enters into that from the salt bridge. So no matter how this works, anions will always migrate towards the anode and cations towards the cathode. Anions, anode, cations, cathode. Except you don't have to remember that. If you kind of, and we'll show a picture of this, visualize what's happening in the voltaic cell, this makes sense. So here's the overall picture. So we see that uh, same uh, reaction we've seen before. Here is my two half cells. We have our cathode, we have our anode. Now again, what's happening at the cathode, if we look at the reduction here, that's why it's the cathode, we see as this runs, we're gonna be losing positive charge. Because again, the, the positive charge, the cations are the reactant. Because of that, the potassium, so the salt bridge contains potassium nitrate, the potassium is moving in to balance out that lost positive charge. Likewise here, we're producing positive charge. So to balance out that production of positive charge, we're gonna move in some negative charge to balance everything out. So if you can look at the two half reactions, you can figure out which way those ions are moving. And again, the electrons will always go from the anode to the cathode. Because again, cathode is reduction, it's one of our simple truths. Reduction is the gain of electrons, our other simple truth. And that means the electrons have to move towards that. Um, likewise, if you've ever seen like a battery, like a, um, which are technically called cells for the most part, they have a positive and a negative end. That's where that comes from. So think of the negative end of the battery, the negative end of the voltaic cell is where the electrons are coming from. The positive end are where the electrons are moving towards. So again, we're going to know the direction of the ions. I just showed that. We see it again. We're noting it. We're moving on. And so that in any voltaic cell, the electrons will flow from the anode through the external circuit to the cathode. That's how every voltaic cell will work. Now, and again, this is because the negative charge, which we associate with electrons, is flowing from the anode to the cathode. We label the anode with the negative sign, and the cathode will always be labeled with a positive sign. And again, the way I think of this is think of the electrons as being attracted to that positive cathode. That's why they're moving towards it, and they're moving away from the negative anode because, again, negative and negative repel. That, that's how I think of this. Okay, so here in 18.4, we're going to start looking at something called e cell EMF. This is one of the most critical calculations that we're going to be doing in this chapter. So when we talk about this, like that zinc, copper, uh, voltaic cell. So why do electrons transfer from those zinc atoms to the, those copper ions? Why is this redox reaction happening? And what we're going to look at in this section is, again, the, the why of this. What's causing those electrons to move through that external circuit in the voltaic cell. 
Now, the rule is that the chemical processes that make up any voltaic cell are spontaneous. And I want to stress this because this is going to save us a lot of grief. If you have a voltaic cell, and if you're told it's a voltaic cell, the reaction that happens in a voltaic cell is spontaneous. That is a definition. Now, some problems may ask, is this spontaneous? Will this happen as written? And then you have some work to do. But if you're told this is a voltaic cell, then we know that the reaction is spontaneous. Now, the reason these electrons move is electrons move from the anode to the cathode uh, in a voltaic cell because there's a difference in potential energy. And what we know is that the potential energy of the electrons is higher in the anode than the cathode, uh, causing them to move. This is more detail than you need. Now, the difference in potential energy per charge called potential difference um, between the two electrons is measured in volts or voltage. One volt is the potential energy required to impart one joule of energy to a charge of one coulomb. Um, as a note, an electron has a charge of 1.60 times 10 to negative 19th. Again, more detail than you need. What we know is there's this thing called voltage. Voltage is that difference in energy. It is that difference in energy or voltage that makes a voltaic cell function. Now the difference in energy between the two electrodes is what's causing um, the electrons to move. It's what's providing that, ex that driving push. So we're gonna call that potential difference the electromotive force or EMF. Um, yeah. Electromotive means electron motion. EMF or E cell, very important, is also called the cell potential. So there's a few different terms for the exact same thing. E cell, cell potential, or voltage all mean the same thing. Now, in any cell reaction that is spontaneous, like in a voltaic cell, cell potential will be positive. That's how it's going to be. If it's a spontaneous reaction, if it's a voltaic cell, spontaneous EMF, spontaneous E cells, or sorry, positive EMF, positive E cell, positive voltage. Now, the actual EMF or voltage of a cell depends on the particular reactions, it depends on the concentrations, and it depends upon the temperature. Now, we're going to focus at things at 25 degrees Celsius because we're going to see what is called standard voltages. So in that case, it's happening at certain molarity, one molar. It's happening at 25 degrees Celsius. So at standard conditions, again, we have one molar concentration for everything. We have 25 degrees Celsius. Then the standard conditions, we call that standard EMF, the standard cell potential, or standard voltage, E cell. So again, E cell with that little knot in there to indicate standard conditions. So for example, that zinc copper voltaic cell that we've seen in previous sections has a standard cell potential or standard voltage of 1.10 volts. Again, it is positive because that voltaic cell happens uh, naturally, that reaction is spontaneous. So standard reduction potentials. Now, again, the EMF of a cell depends upon the specific half reactions taking place in each half cell. We could tabulate the standard potentials for all possible combinations, but that would be insane. So what we've done is we've assigned a standard potential to each individual half cells, and we're gonna use those individual half cell reactions to determine the overall voltage of the cell. So the cell potential is the difference between the two electrode potentials. So we have a half cell potential, two of them really, one for the cathode, one for the anode. Now, due to convention and really how it works, again, um, it's all based upon the potential for reduction, just an arbitrary choice. We said it's all based on potential for reduction. So that means that the standard electrode potentials are found for the reduction reactions. Now as a note, remember the reduction only takes place at the cathode. The anode has oxidation happening, but the voltage is seen for reduction. 
The standard potentials is all based on reduction as an arbitrary choice, and how this shapes up is going to be a influenced and change kind of how our equation looks. So we're going to see something called standard reduction potentials. Um, for problems in, uh, in the homework, you're going to have to look up these values in your book. On the AP test, they will be provided to you in the problem. So calculating the standard cell potential or voltage of the cell. So the cell potential is given by the standard reduction potential of the cathode minus the standard reduction potential of the anode. So in other words, cathode minus anode. That's how it is. Again, these potentials are all reduction. That's just how they're set up. So we look at what's happening at the cathode, subtract from what's happening at the anode. That's it. That's it. Now, since every voltaic cell involves those two half cells, cathode and anode, it is impossible to measure standard reduction potential directly. It's kind of like um, in physics, when you learn about potential energy, that there's no always, this is potential energy zero, it's you choose some arbitrary point. We do the same thing here. Everything's based upon a certain reference, arbitrarily chosen half reaction. And what we do is we look at this. So the reduction of hydrogen uh, ions to hydrogen gas, that's what we have defined as zero. Some reduction potentials will be higher. That means that those reactions have a greater uh, potential to be reduced. Some will be negative. That means that they have less potential to be reduced um, or instead of potential, easier or harder, really. So if it's a positive reduction potential, it means it's easier to reduce than hydrogen. If it's negative, it means it's harder to reduce than hydrogen. Zero, doesn't, zero is just an arbitrary point between positive and negative. Now again, this various standard reduction potentials for half reactions are found on page 873 of your book, um, table 18.1 or appendix two. Um, table D in your textbook, but again, on an AP test, these will be provided to you. So, uh, because electrical potential measures potential energy per charge, standard reduction potentials are intensive. What this means is that if we increase the amount of chemicals, so if we double all the coefficients in the reaction, if we change how much there, we increase both the energy and charges, which means that the voltage stays the same. I want to stress this. Standard reduction potentials do not depend upon the coefficients. The coefficients in the reaction do not matter. The amount of the chemicals do not matter. So again, changing the stoichiometric coefficients does not affect the standard reduction potential. It is again, for the cell, the whole cell, cathode minus anode. You look up the two values, you look up the reaction that's happening at the cathode, you look at the re reaction that's taking place at the anode, cathode minus anode. And if it's an actual voltaic cell, and this is the secret, if it's an actual voltaic cell and you're told that it is an actual voltaic cell, then again, voltage has to be positive. So cathode minus anode, it has to be bigger minus smaller. You look up the two values, bigger minus smaller, period, done. So an example, so we are told that the standard reduction potential of zinc is negative 0.76 volts. We're going to find the um, reduction potential for copper, uh, two plus the copper for the following voltaic cell. So we're looking at the zinc to copper. This is our reaction. So again, we have the two half reactions. We have zinc turning into uh, zinc two plus. We have copper two plus turning into copper. Those are the two reactions. We are told that the cell potential is 1.10 volts. Okay. And so we have kind of two reactions. So we see copper to becoming copper. Now looking at this, and this is what I really recommend doing, kind of write out the two half reactions. So copper two plus, because that's what we have in the reactants, becoming copper, because that's what we have in the product. Looking at that, I know that the electrons have to go in the reactant side, because with that two plus charge, we need some negatives to make it neutral, like it is on the right. Now, since the electrons are on the left, that means it's gaining electrons. Gaining electrons is reduction. So the copper is being reduced. The reduction takes place at the cathode. Again, cats must be reduced. 
So when we look at cathode minus anode, zinc then has to be being oxidized, therefore it's at the anode. We're given the potential for E cell, so it's 1.10 equals the cathode minus the anode. I add, point, uh, sorry, subtract 0.76 from both sides. I get 0.34, and that's what we get. Another example, so using standard reduction potentials provided, calculate the standard EMF for the voltaic cell. So again, because we're told it's a voltaic cell, we know it has to be positive. That makes life simpler. So we have this big, messy equation here. So I look in the book. Same reaction there. So the two half reactions involved. So I see this dichromate, so I look up dichromate. Um, that's really what I focus on, Try, because there's lots of junk there. I just focus on things that are unique. Um, and we see the dichromate going from Cr2072 negative. Um, and we see here in this reaction with the six electrons, and it kind of matches up. We see that Cr3 plus in the product. So it's there as written. It's always written as reduction, so that makes it the cathode. I look up the value. It's 1.33. We have that iodide now. Now, here I've kind of reversed it. So this reaction as written is the oxidation. And again, I notice this because I see the iodide going to iodine. So another way I could look at this is it's that iodide becoming iodine. And for that to work, electrons have to be on the right side or else we couldn't balance out the charge. And since the electrons on the right side, that means that is being oxidized if anything that's taking place at the anode. But you're not going to see this reaction on any of the tables. What you'll see is this I2, let's see, it would divide all this by three, uh, plus two electrons goes to two I minus, yeah. That's what we'd actually see, but because the reduction, it's always set in terms of reduction. When I look up this reaction, I see it has a cell potential of 0.54. So again, once you can identify what reactions are taking place, you can really just do that bigger minus smaller because we're told it's a voltaic cell. So I plug everything in, cathode minus anode, bigger minus smaller. I plug it in, I get my cell potential. If we're told it's a voltaic cell, it is that simple. Now again, analyzing this, again, for each of the half cells involved, the standard reduction potential gives a measure of the driving force for the reaction. Again, that means the more positive it is, the greater the driving force for reduction. Um, so again, if, a, if all voltaic cells in the reaction at the cathode, the cathode is going to be more positive. It's going to be bigger because the cathode is where reduction is taking place. Therefore, the thing with the greater chance of being reduced is going to be where things are being reduced. That's what this gets to. Now, we know that the uh, cell, standard cell potential is the difference between the standard reduction potentials of the cathode minus the standard reduction potential of the anode. And so we can think of that E cell, that EMF is the driving force. That's what's causing those electrons to be pushed through the external circuit. An example, so we have a voltaic cell based upon the following two half reactions. So again, notice both these are given in terms of reduction, but only one of these are actually going to be reduced. So how do we figure out which one is reduced? Which one takes place at the cathode? So we're going to find the half reactions that occur at the anode and the cathode. So we need to find the standard reduction potentials for each. So I look them up. Standard reduction potential for that cadmium 2 plus to cadmium is negative 0.403. Uh, tin 2 plus to tin is negative 0.136. Again, it's bigger minus smaller. Cathode minus anode, whichever is bigger, is the one that will be reduced. And negative 0.136 is larger than negative 0.403. Therefore, the cathode is going to be the tin. The cadmium is going to be the opposite of as written because at the anode, that's where oxidation takes place. So we, we, we just flip, we reverse that reaction. So to determine the standard cell potential, again, bigger minus smaller, bigger minus smaller, we get our answer. Now, how to tell something that is easily reduced or oxidized? Again, the way we're going to view this, the more positive the reduction potential value is, the greater the tendency of that reactant to be reduced, which means the greater chance of it to basically something else to be oxidized. And you have this table in your book. It lists the ability uh, to uh, be an oxidizing or reducing agent. 
Um, again, the greater the uh, delta, uh, the say reduction potential, the more chance it'll be to be reduced. So in 18.5, we're going to keep looking at very similar reaction that we did last time, but now we're going to bring together this idea of equilibrium and free energy. So we're tying in the last few chapters into this. Now, again, voltaic cells, I want to stress this, if it is a voltaic cell, it is spontaneous. That's how it is. Now, that means that any reaction that occurs in a voltaic cell will have a positive EMF and will be spontaneous. So we can actually determine spontaneity of a redox reaction by deciding if it produces a positive EMF. So we can look at a reaction and ask, will this happen spontaneously? And if it gives us a positive EMF, then the answer is yes. So we're going to take our previous equation of cathode minus anode and twist it just a little bit. Instead of cathode minus anode, it's reduction minus oxidation. So we can actually apply this to any reaction that's a redox reaction, not just a voltaic cell one. So we can take any reaction, look at what's being reduced, look at what's being oxidized, do who's being reduced by who's being oxidized, and if the answer is positive, that means the reaction as written is spontaneous. So same thing as before. Again, positive value tells it's spontaneous. Negative is non-spontaneous. Now, we can use E, not E naught, but E to represent EMF under non-standard conditions. E naught would be standard conditions. That's going to come into play soon. So for example, using standard reduction potentials, we're going to determine whether or not the following reactions are spontaneous. So we're not being told they are. We're not being told this is a voltaic cell. We're saying, here's some reactions. Will they be spontaneous? So we have this and this. So for the first one, so I look up the two half reactions so I can see copper going to copper two plus, hydrogen ions going to hydrogen. We can see again, the copper is being oxidized, the hydrogen is being reduced, the two half reactions, we would see this. Now as a note, we do have to identify who's being oxidized and who's being reduced. Now notice the two half reactions I did here are both reduction half reactions because that's how we get the standard reduction potentials over here. But looking at the equation up top, we recognize that as written, so we can, I look at this hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas, hydrogen ions to hydrogen gas, so the hydrogen is being reduced because it's as written. The copper is the reverse, so the copper is being oxidized. So I now plug things in. Instead of uh, cathode minus anode, it's reduced minus oxidized. So I get my answers. I see negative. Because it's negative, that tells me this reaction, as written, will not be spontaneous. Same thing. So I look here. So I look at the two half reactions. I see chlorine to chloride. I see iodide to iodine. So again, I look up the two half reactions. This time I actually switched the oxidation one around. I can, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the value at all. I do uh, reduction minus oxidation. I get 0.82. That means this reaction as written will occur. So um, in chemistry, we, we dealt with a uh, single, not really double replacement reaction, but single replacement, we had to uh, consult the metal activity series to see if one metal will replace another. Um, what it turns out, that metal activity series is the reduction potentials in reverse. Because uh, it's all about oxidation. So again, the activity series is the opposite of reduction potential series. So uh, for instance, um, I think it was lithium was at the top of our metal activity series. So that would be at the bottom of our reduction potential series, so a very, very negative number. Now, I told you we can tie this to free energy because free energy is also a way to describe spontaneity. And because EMF and delta G can both describe spontaneity, we can link the two terms together by this. Very simple equation, it's on your equation packet. Now, N is gonna be a positive number without units, I'll describe it in a moment. And what it is, it represents the number of electrons transferred in the reaction. And the way you do this 
is you look at the two half reactions. You look at the two half reactions involved in the reaction. And then what you have to do is you have, remember in a redox reaction, the number of electrons has to be conserved. So you look at the two half reactions and then you multiply each reaction by some number if needed so that the number of electrons being gained and lost are the same. Whatever that number of electrons is, the number, so N will be the, the number of electrons transferred, so it should be the same number for the oxidation and the reduction half reaction. That's what your N is. F is Faraday's constant, it's just a constant. Notice it's gonna be in joules here, so we're gonna output joules for the delta G, and that's what we see the uh, joules per mole. Uh, again, both N and F are positive, so that means positive E means negative delta G. So again, spontaneous positive E means spontaneous negative delta G. Now, since we also could link together delta G, so free energy with equilibrium constant, we can actually do the same thing. So we can relate the standard EMF to equilibrium. Uh, we'll play with that in a moment. So we're going to use the standard reduction potentials to calculate the standard free energy change and the equilibrium constant at room temperature. So we have this reaction. So we look at it. Now looking at it, we can actually pretty easily see the number of electrons being transferred because I see neutral. I see four positive charges. So there should be four electrons being transferred. So again, I can bring this into the half reactions. So we see there, I got my reduction potentials. And again, I note here, so this first reaction as written would have four electrons. If you look up the oxygen to water with hydrogen, you'd see four electrons. Now this silver reaction here, we'd only see the one, but the number of electrons has to be the same. So I multiply all the uh, coefficients by four, including the electrons. So we have an equal number of electrons being transferred. So that N will be four. So I can find the E naught, products minus, uh, um, cathode minus anode, or who's being reduced minus who's being oxidized. So we get 0.43. I plug this in. So we get our delta G. I get a number, and I'm going to turn this into kilojoules here because it's a little bit simpler to work with. Now we can solve for K. So again, we have this. I solve for K. I get my answer. So the other thing that we see, it kind of ties back into the last unit, that when we say that something, and you can see that K value is very, very, very large. So we saw previously that positive, um, sorry, uh, a K value greater than one and a negative delta G mean the same thing. So when the, uh, if, the pro if the equilibrium favors the products, it's spontaneous. It's a way to view that. This also means positive voltage means favors the products. Now, why would we end up doing this? To find an equilibrium constant for something like this, that finding that K experimentally is very, 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 very hard to measure, but voltage is measured pretty easily. So this would be an easier experiment to do with voltage than it would be in terms of concentrations with like a colorimeter or something. And there's kind of two linkages here. Um, so we have this one, and we have this one. So in section 18.6, we're going to look at the relationship between cell potential and concentration when we're out of these uh, standard conditions. So think about a normal battery. So you have a voltaic cell as it's discharged, as it's used. In fact, any reaction, reactants are used up, products are generated. That's what we see happening in spontaneous reactions. Now that means the concentrations are going to shift. Over time, the concentrations of the reactants goes down, the concentration of the products goes up. Now, the EMF keeps going down of the, um, in general until the uh, EMF equals zero, at which point we say the cell is dead. At this point, the concentration of the reactants and products will cease to change. In other words, we're actually, we've actually reached equilibrium at that point. Now, what this section will look at is how that EMF changes with concentration, which is going to show us non-standard conditions. Now, as a note, we're looking at this qualitatively, not quantitatively. There is an equation that runs this called the Nernst equation, but you do not need to know how to use it on the AP test.
Now, the general rule is this. If the concentrations of the reactants increase relative to the concentration of the products, EMF goes up, higher voltage. Whereas the opposite is also true. If the concentration of the products relative to the reactants goes up, the EMF goes down. At which point, which is what happens when a battery goes dead. We use up the reactants, we end up with lots of products, product concentration increases, reactant concentration goes down, eventually voltage equals zero, and the battery is dead. So again, the way we can think of this, again, the more the reactant concentrations go up, the stronger the cell, the higher the voltage. The more product we end up having, having the weaker. So we're going to work through this with this example. So we see a uh, cell that we've seen before. Um, in this case, X is copper. It has uh, the overall cell has a voltage of 0.47, and this is the overall reaction. So we want we want to remember that voltage of 4.7 is kind of our basics here. And this reaction, I'm going to put that reaction on each slide so we can see what's going on. Again, reaction is there up top. So what we're going to see is different laboratory setups. Uh, we set this up for each of the following three scenarios. We're going to choose the correct value of the cell voltage and be able to justify our decision. And again, the E-cell, standard E-cell is 0.47. So first one is the student bumps the cell setup, resulting in the salt bridge losing contact with the solution in the cathode department. So again, cathode is where reduction takes place. Uh, reduction is, uh, once again, that gain of electrons. So if we look at the two half reactions here, we should see that happening in the uh, copper solution because we would see that copper 2 plus turning into copper. And the only way for that to happen is for two electrons to be added. So we, uh, salt bridge loses contact. Will the uh, voltage be equal to 0.47, less than 0.47 or greater? Pause here if you want a moment to ponder. Okay, pondered, and the answer would be less than 0.47. Again, salt bridges are necessary for the voltaic cell to run. This is how it maintains the charge that it started with. If the salt bridge loses contact with either of the components, uh, cell does not work. Voltage would be pretty much close to zero, if not zero. We'll say zero. Next, a student spills a small amount of 0.5 molar sodium sulfate into the compartment with the uh, lead electrode, resulting in the formation of precipitate. So we're forming a precipitate here in the lead electrode. Now, here's where we have to be careful. So if the precipitate is forming, what is it reacting with? Well, again, nitrate is our always soluble list, so it's forming with the lead. So as the precipitate is happening, what we see happening is the lead ions are going down in terms of concentration because they're being used to form a solid, forming a precipitate. So what's happening here is this lead 2 plus, which is there in the products, in the products. So the product concentration is going down. Remember, it's all about reacting concentration to product concentration. We don't care about the solids. They don't have a concentration. But the product concentration goes down. That means voltage goes, and again, pause here if you need a moment to decide, voltage goes up. Again, voltage is higher if reacting concentration goes higher relative to the product concentration. That means either increasing the reactant concentration, which would mean increasing the copper ions, or decreasing the product. In this case, we decrease the product. That means voltage goes up. Last example, after the laboratory session is over, a student leaves the switch closed. That means it's going to be running. The next day, the student opens the switch and reads the voltmeter. Is voltage less than 0.47, greater than 0.47, or equal to 0.47? So this means as it runs, the copper ions are being used up. Lead ions are being increased. That means reactants are decreasing. Products are increasing. That means voltage goes down. Just so it would happen normally in a normal cell, normal battery. Now, concentration cells are another thing. These are a weird sort of cell. So they're still a voltaic cell. They're still spontaneous. But so far, we've seen ones where we have different chemicals of the anode and the cathode. Um, and the cell EMF depends on the concentration. But it turns out that, that concentration actually can be used to make a voltaic cell. So you can use the same chemicals at both the anode and the cathode if they have the same concentration.
sorry, as long as they have different concentrations, my apologies. A cell based upon the EMF generated because of a difference in concentration only, we call a concentration cell. So here's an example of this. So notice in this reaction on the left, both solutions have a concentration of one molar. There is no difference in the concentration, and we see a voltage of zero. But notice here, here on the left, we see a concentration of 0 0.0. 1, 0. Here on the right, we see a concentration of 2. Now, because there's a difference in concentration, we get a voltage. Now, how do we know who the cathode and anode is? Think of it this way. The system wants to equalize the concentrations. It wants to equalize the concentrations. That means in this one here on the left, let me erase what's there so we kind of have a clean slate to work with. When I look at this one here on the left, the concentration is going to go up because that's going to give us, uh, we want to equalize it. The concentration on the right goes down. Now, if we look at the two half reactions, if we want the concentration to increase, that means the copper ions have to be on the right. So that would be copper to copper ions. And again, for things to work out, neutral charge. The electrons have to be on the right. That means oxidation. That means anode. On the right, for the concentration to go down, that means the copper ions have to be used up, turning into copper metal. That means, again, electrons have to be on the left. That means reduction. That means it's the cathode. So that's how we view this. It's all about that it wants to make it neutral. But to make it neutral, one side has to increase in concentration, one side has to decrease in concentration. So again, in an overview, in a concentration cell, the more dilute half cell will become more concentrated. That means more ions. The more concentrated half cell will seek to become more dilute, decreasing the number of ions. So with this cell, in the 0 0.01 molar half cell is more dilute, so it'll create ions, so it's creating those copper ions. So that's the reaction that we would see, and that means oxidation is taking place, and that means it's the anode. In the 2 molar half cell, it starts more concentrated, so it needs to become less concentrated. So now those ions are on the left, and that means it's reduction, meaning it's the cathode. So we are now looking at 18.8. We are looking at this idea of electrolysis. This is going to be really the complete opposite of what we're doing with a voltaic cell. So voltaic cells are all based around spontaneous redox reactions. Now again, spontaneous just means that this will happen naturally without outside interference. But we can make a non-spontaneous reaction happen with the input of energy. And that's what an ele electrolytic cell is, or what electrolysis is, is it's forcing a non-spontaneous process to happen with the addition of electrical energy where you apply voltage. So for instance, a great example of this is we can use electricity to decompose molten sodium chloride into its component elements of sodium and chlorine. That is normally a non-spontaneous process. Salt doesn't turn naturally back into sodium metal and chlorine gas. But if you melt it and apply an electrical current uh, through it, it will. So this is what we see. This would be a non-spontaneous process, but we can make it happen. So we call again these non-spontaneous reactions driven by outside electrical energy and electrolysis reaction. Really again, they are the opposite of a voltaic cell, or they're also called an electrolytic cell. Yeah. So in, electro, in an electrolytic cell, it's often made of two electrodes and a molten salt or a solution. Now, the reason you need things like molten salts and not just solutions uh, sometimes is that um, if water will react before one of the salts, you're not going to get, or one of the ions in the salt, you're not going to get what you want. Now, in this case, what you're going to use is you're going to use a battery or some other form of direct electrical current as your electron pump, as your voltage source. So, again, think about this like a normal voltaic cell has a certain voltage. Think of that, once again, that's that electromotive force. That's the amount of force pushing the electrons through for the reaction to happen. To make this run backwards, 
you need a counter push. You need to push the opposite way with at least as much force as would naturally be occurring. Now, just like in a voltaic cell, the electrode at which reduction occurs is called the cathode, in which oxidation occurs is called the anode, but we've just reversed who the cathode and anode would be from the voltaic cell. So for instance, here is um, two reactions are the same reaction, but backwards. So on the left, we see the voltaic cell and electrons are moving kind of from left to right from the zinc to the copper. And that's what will naturally happen. But if I want the reverse to happen, if I want to run this backwards as an electrolytic cell, where the electrons are running from now from the copper to the zinc, we need to apply a voltage source at least equal to the natural EMF of the voltaic cell. So in this case, we would need a voltage source of greater than 1.10 volts. Doing this runs the reaction backwards. Now again, where the electrons are going, where reduction takes place is still the cathode. We've just swapped who's the cathode and who's the anode. Now things to notice with this. So again, in a voltaic cell, electrons move from the negative and so that means that the electrode of the electrolytic cell that is connected to the negative uh, so volt, uh, so terminal of the voltage source is the cathode um, because it's receiving the electrons that are used to reduce the substance. Again, we can kind of think of this, electrons come out from the negative. Same idea there. Um, now, the electrons that are removed during the oxidation process of the anode travel to the positive terminal of the voltage source. Again, same idea as before, but now we have a voltage source present, and think of the negative being providing the electrons and the positive taking in the electrons. Uses for this. Uh, great use is electroplating. So electroplating is a process often used in art. Uh, or jewelry making where you use electrolysis to deposit a thin layer of one metal on top of another, often a precious metal on top of a cheap metal. Um, so you have metal in a solution and it becomes deposited onto the cathode. And this only requires a pretty small voltage. So this is something that's actually quite doable even in home situations. So here's an example of silver plating. So you take a solution that has silver ions, so there's silver ions in this solution, that's what those are. You have a silver electrode and then some object to be plated. It could be like a cheap piece of copper, like a copper ring. And what's happening here is as this runs, the electrons are leaving the silver, creating silver ions into the solution and the electrons are being pulled up into the positive end and being pushed out of the negative end. And as they get pushed into the negative end and into that piece of metal at the bottom, the silver ions are gaining those electrons and getting plated onto there. So you end up with a thin layer, in this case of silver, on top of some cheap metal. It could be iron, copper, something like that. Now, electrical work. Now remember, that a positive value of E is associated with a negative free energy change. Again, positive voltage means things are spontaneous. We also know that for any spontaneous process, we can use delta G to measure the maximum amount of work. It's the same thing. Since we have this equation, delta G equals negative NFE, that means our work that can be done is equal to negative NFE. Um, and the cell EMF for a voltaic cell is positive, so W max will be negative. And negative work means that work is being done by the system on the surroundings. Now, in an electrolytic cell, we're using external energy to bring about those non-spontaneous um, reactions. Therefore, delta G is positive and E cell is negative. And that means to force this to occur, we need to apply that external voltage whose magnitude is larger than the natural E cell. So again, think about this as the, the natural voltaic cell voltage, that EMF, that's the force that will naturally be happening to push the electrons in one direction. We want that to be backwards. We want to reverse it. So we need to push harder in the opposite direction. 
Now, when this happens, uh, the external energy is being applied to the cell. The surroundings are doing the work on the system, and therefore, the work is being done on the system. You don't need to worry about this, to be completely honest. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. We'll move on. So here's another example. So this is actually how we generate um, some really volatile elements. So here's how you make sodium. You start with molten salt. Start with molten salt. You put two inert electrodes in your bath of molten salt, not aqueous salt, molten salt. And what'll happen is as it runs, so you have these sodium ions and these chloride ions, the sodium ions will become sodium metal, which means to do that, they have to gain electrons. The chloride ions will become chlorine gas, which means they lose electrons. Standard rules apply, gaining electrons is reduction. So that's why it's happening at the cathode. Uh, gaining, electro um, gaining electrons is oxidation. So it's happening at the anode. Same rules apply. Electrons are flowing through, through from that external source. And we it would actually end up plating sodium metal on the electrode and producing chlorine gas up there, which would be terribly dangerous. Do not do this. Now, the reason we don't do this in an aqueous solution is it turns out, so we still get that oxidation of the ion, um, like let's say we had sodium iodide instead of sodium chloride, we still get the oxidation of the anion there, but it turns out that water reduces easier than sodium does. And so the water actually reduces here, gaining those electrons before the sodium will, so you'll actually just get hydrogen gas bubbles. Not what you want if you want to be producing uh, sodium metal. A few final notes. Um, we can talk about electrical work in terms of watts times time. A watt is a joule per second. Therefore, a watt second is a joule. So you often run across this in terms of like power companies when your parents pay their electricity bill. It's in terms of kilowatt hours. So that's power times time, which is equals energy. So that's where that comes from. Uh, a few other notes. So when we talk electricity and electrolytic cells, we have to talk current. Uh, the flow of electrons is what we call current. It's measured in the unit of an ampere or an amp. And it's really coulombs per second. And all these little units are going to come into play in a moment. We also use Faraday's constant, which is 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons. Because there's a question that comes up periodically on AP testing, which requires some weird unit conversions with these particular conversions. Um, so Here's an example. We want to calculate the number of grams of aluminum produced in one hour by the electrolysis of molten aluminum chloride if the electrical current is 10 amps. So starting with this, um, so again, the reaction that's happening, so aluminum is going to, aluminum ions are becoming aluminum, so we see three electrons there. We know that 10 amps is 10 coulombs per second. So we're often going to see this amps, which is really coulombs per second. That's just something you have to remember. Then we have Faraday's constant, which is 96,500 coulombs uh, per, uh, uh, yeah, so we'll get that. Uh, we get the time. There's three moles of electrons per mole of aluminum from that reaction we just saw. Again, Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons. And there's that mole of electrons there. So we start with the 10 amps, which is really 10 coulombs per second. We want to turn this into grams. So what we do is I get rid of the seconds by multiplying by the time. That's that, that, that time that we had there in seconds because seconds here. Now here's Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is going to let us get rid of those coulombs because it's 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons. Now we're in moles of electrons. Now we can use the stoichiometry of the problem. There are three moles of electrons for every mole of aluminum, which is what we get here. And finally, once we're in moles of aluminum, we can turn it to grams of aluminum and we get our answer. You will see calculations like this, but again, the heart of it almost always is, is you're doing this amps, which is really equal to I'll say, some number of amps, which is really some number of coulombs per second then you're going to use Faraday's constant, 96,500 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. 
then you're going to use moles of electrons to moles of the element and just look at the charge that it has and finally once you're in moles of that element you can go uh, grams of that element using molar mass well that's it that's the chapter that's done that's electrochemistry